Hello fellows, Mr. Creepy Creeps here. If you are new here, you can subscribe our channel. We upload daily horror videos. My husband went to India two weeks ago. What came back isn't him. I'm scared. I'm, I'm writing this from the bathroom right now. I'm pretty sure he was asleep when I got out of bed, but I don't know how long I can stay in here without making him suspicious if he isn't. I fear that the man I married isn't the man laying on our bed right now. I just want someone to tell me that I'm crazy, or that this is all part of some fucked up dream I'm having right now that I'll soon wake up from. A couple years ago I was at the lowest point in my life. My mental health was down in the gutter, and I had started to isolate myself. I never had many friends to begin with, and the few I did weren't really friends as much as superficial acquaintances. I was born and raised in a small town in Missouri, and moving to Los Angeles, California for college had seemed exciting at first, but it all came crashing down when the loneliness of it all set in. I had a hard time socializing and spent my college years without really going out much or making any friends. I had pretty much lost a lot of my social skills and had started to become bitter. I would spend a lot of my time on the internet, complaining about the way the world was, and scroll for hours without really feeling any sense of joy. There were days I would completely dissociate, for hours at a time, and at night, I would break down crying. Things got worse for me when I signed up for a dating app. At first, it seemed exciting. Scrolling through a sea of men, I found myself fantasizing about potentially breaking out of this lonely hell. But what I really got out of the app were self-esteem issues and a feeling of disgust directed towards myself. I had gone on dates with people I wasn't really attracted to out of desperation, and when things led nowhere, I felt disgusted with myself. At this point, I had completely withdrawn from society and my grades started to suffer as I did just the bare minimum. I had stopped caring for myself. All I had was my part-time job and an empty life. That's when I met Jay. My phone popped with a notification telling me that I had another match. It didn't really matter much to me at first as I was used to things going nowhere on those apps. But Jay felt different. Jay was an immigrant, he had been in this country for two years at that point, and he too had a hard time socializing. Work and education had taken up most of his time and much like me, he hoped to find a way out of the loneliness through the app. But struck me about Jay was his optimistic way of looking at things. He was a man who would looking at the good that would come out of a situation and wouldn't let it bring him down. It felt like a bright light had been lit in my dark world, and now all that mattered was that I spend every second with him. Five years later and we were both happily married. I was so happy that the past felt like the shadow of a bad dream that had long faded. Jay and I worked hard to pay the bills, but we cherished every moment we had together. We also got a little kitten, the sweetest little orange goblin we called him Maximus. Two weeks ago, after my shift ended at the grocery store I worked at, I found Jay in the kitchen. Instantly, I knew something was wrong. His eyes looked distant, as if he had learned of something troubling, and he looked at me hesitant. He told me that his father back in India was really sick, and that he need to go visit him. I comforted him, and even though I was really reluctant to let him go, I knew that it was something he had to do. I wanted to go with him, but he refused. We couldn't afford it, and he told me that he wouldn't be long there but I assured him that he should take as much time as he needs, and I'll be here when he comes back. He left the same night, leaving behind Maximus and me in this empty home. We talked on the phone every night. I wanted to FaceTime him every day, but he was in a rural part of India where it was difficult for him to connect to the internet. I picked up more hours during this time, knowing that he wouldn't be there when I get home. But when I did get home, I'd looking forward to our calls. When we weren't talking, I'd take the time to play with Maximus, but it felt like he really missed Jay much more than I did, meowing every night looking for him. Four days ago, Jay called me to tell me that his father was recovering and that he would be fine. This was great news, and I got really excited when he told me that he was coming back the next day. I took two days off. I went a little overboard with decorating the house for his arrival. I also made chicken Alfredo for dinner, a recipe he loved. I drove to the airport to pick him up and found him waiting for me outside. The second he got in my car, I felt wrong. I can't really find a word for it. 
but I will try to describe how it felt. I remember chills running up my spine and I felt the urge to shield myself. I felt uncomfortable around him. He greeted me but it felt very unenthusiastic, like he didn't care to see me at all. I brushed it up to exhaustion and let him rest in silence as I drove us home. He never tried to make conversation or sleep or really do anything the entire ride home. He just sort of stared out at his feet the entire ride. When we got home, I remembered Maximus and I was excited to see his reaction to Jay coming home. But when we got in the apartment, Maximus was nowhere to be seen. I called out his name and went into our bedroom while Jay lurked in the kitchen. I found the cat hiding under the bed and I tried to get him to come out but he just wouldn't. I heard footsteps behind me and stood up to find Jay there. I laughed and tried to get Maximus to come out again but this time he hissed at Jay and me before running out the bedroom, scared. I tried to ignore this but I couldn't. I asked Jay if he needed a shower but he refused. We went straight to dinner and he was eerily silent again, just staring at the food. I asked him if everything was okay and he just mumbled a yeah and began to eat. At bedtime I climbed up to his chest and he seemed confused for a second before easing up. I figured that he was tired, trying not to think about Maximus and how scared he seemed and pushing my own feelings down. I was just happy that he was here no matter what. I closed my eyes trying to listen to the sound of his heart when I heard nothing. I adjusted my head a little trying to listen for it but again, I heard nothing. I looked up at Jay and he was asleep so I decided to try to get some sleep as well. I'm not religious but I said a little prayer before sleeping because I was a bit scared. I didn't turn the lights off since he didn't seem to mind either. That night I had terrible dreams. I heard this drumming in my dreams, along with the sounds of bells ringing violently. I heard a woman scream and then a child's. Shadows formed by a fire casted the shape of a skinny man on the wall, and then the shadow grew horns. I jolted up. Jay was no longer in bed. I had the worst heat key of my life that morning. Jay wasn't home. I went to feed the cat, but Maximus didn't run up to me as he usually would when it was feeding time. I filled his bowl and then went looking for him. I found him hiding under the couch. I tried to get him out again but he scratched me hissing and then running into the bedroom. I had a sinking feeling in my gut and I called Jay. His phone rang and I heard it in the bedroom. Wherever he was he had left his phone behind. I stayed up all day waiting for him, eventually falling asleep on the couch. My head was killing me. I woke up in the dark. I had slept through the day somehow. My head throbbed and I woke up to Jay standing over me with a smile. I flinched and sank away. The smile disappeared as fast as I did, changing to a more neutral expression. That smile, it wasn't like him. It was too fake, like he was mimicking something he didn't understand. I asked him how long he had been standing there and where he'd been all day. He told that he had a few work-related errands to run. Yes, he literally said he had work-related errands to run. He gave me another vague reply when I pressed him about it. I asked once again if he was okay, and he said he was, and that he was just tired. I asked him if he knew where Maximus was. He laughed and said that he was probably around the house somewhere. I got you a present, Jay said, and then that fucking smile started to creep on his face again, sending shivers down my spine. It was like the smile of a predator, comforting prey into a false sense of security. But you'll have to wait until tomorrow. And with that, he got closer to me, his eyes lustful. I backed away, feeling uncomfortable. I told him my head hurts and that I'd much rather prefer to take a few painkillers and sleep it off. He smiled again, but there was rage behind those eyes. I don't know how, but I could see a boiling anger, like he was toying with the idea of snapping my neck. The smile widened and he went into the bedroom, laying on the bed. I went in and he seemed fast asleep. He was snoring loud, while still in his boots. I didn't dare wake him at this point. I went into the bathroom to take my painkillers and that's when I started writing this. I really don't know what's going on and I would really appreciate some help here. Am I being too paranoid? My head hurts so fucking much right now that I'm crying. I'm really scared and I don't know what's going on. Any advice will be helpful here. I feel like I'm lost.
A lot has happened since my last post, and I don't even know where to begin. I've tried multiple times to type this out, but my head has been killing me. My vision gets so blurry, and I feel the need to lay down every single time, but I feel slightly better now. That night after typing out my story, I sat in the bathroom for a couple of minutes. I felt an emptiness in my chest, almost as if my heart had sunk down into a bottomless pit. I stared at the door waiting for a knock or maybe a rattle. I feared that the thing pretending to be my husband would break the door down and I'd have nowhere to go. I feared going out there, my own bedroom, and being in the dark with whatever that thing was. I looked at the tiny window at the back of the bathroom, wondering if I could fit through there. It didn't matter that I'd fall 50 feet to my death. I was overwhelmed with fear. I pictured the thing silently waiting by the door and felt tears run down my cheek, realizing that I had found myself in a corner. That's when I heard something, a soft sound coming from the door. I flinched silently when I realized that it was a scratching noise and tried my best to hold in a scream, but all my fears disappeared when I saw a white paw trying to reach underneath the door. Perhaps he wanted to be in there with me, or perhaps he wanted to comfort me, but the thought of my cat being out there gave me a moment of courage. I silently opened the door and stepped out. I had braced myself for anything, silently muttering a prayer that I wouldn't see anything unnatural. Maximus, my cat, lit by the light emanating from the bathroom, reached up to me. I was focused on nothing else. I picked him up. The darkness was overwhelming. I slowly took one step out of the bedroom when I heard his voice. Becky. Jay whispered in a sickly voice. I only saw his shape in the dark. He was still on the bed. I felt Maximus tense up in my arms. Bex? I heard the covers shift and the bed creak. He sat up. I... I don't feel all right. I didn't say anything. I wanted to make sure that I could get away if something happened. I took a step back. Jay began to sob. He buried his head into his hands, and even though it was too dark to make out anything other than his shape, I was still taken aback by seeing him cry. I did a horrible thing. He cried and then coughed. I wanted to comfort him to see what was going on. Maybe all of this had been paranoia. Maybe he wasn't possessed or whatever I thought he was, and I just imagined all of this. Maybe this wasn't real to begin with. I felt a stab of guilt for my doubts. I still loved my husband from the depths of my heart, and I wanted to be there for him. Abruptly, the crying stopped. Bex, he said. Turn on the light. I watched his shadow sit up straight and just watch me motionless. Jay, I, I tried to protest. He just stared at me. I felt an intense fear. I feared what I might see if I was to turn on the light. Jay, please go to bed. I love you, but you need help, I said. Maximus relaxed in my arms. We can talk tomorrow. Jay sighed and lay down. I waited for a couple seconds and watched. He lay motionless, and soon after, I began to hear snores. With Maximus in the passenger seat, I drove away from the building. I felt a relief like never before. I felt safe. I needed help, but I had no one in this city except for the man I was afraid of. I picked up my phone and called the only other person who could help me. Jay's mom was a sweet woman. She had been very accepting of me despite the cultural differences. We never really had a proper conversation since there was a bit of a language barrier, but I was desperate right now. It took her three rings to pick up. She sounded cheery on the other end, but we had trouble understanding each other. She kept mentioning Jay's name, which I interpreted as her asking me to put him on the phone to translate for me, but since I couldn't get him on, it didn't work out. She hung up, and I began to cry in frustration. I felt completely lost, completely alone. I considered calling my dad for a second, but we hadn't spoken in years, and I was hesitant about it. But before I could make that decision, I got a call back from Jay's mom, and I answered immediately. Hello? I heard an enthusiastic male voice from the other end. Becky, this is Mohit, Jay's cousin. Is everything okay? Where's Jay? I could hear Jay's mom talking in the back, I assume telling him what to say. Mohit, I, 
I don't know how to start, I... I broke down. I told him everything that happened and he listened. There was a moment of silence as he translated everything to Jay's mom, and then another silence fell. And then, she began to say something, and Mohit translated every word of it. The enthusiasm had been sucked out of his voice. Becky, Bua tells you to stay strong. There was something off with the boy the last day he was here, but we assumed that he missed you. Bua hoped it was just that. You should stay away from him for now. My Bua will talk to someone who knows about this stuff, but just to be safe, we will be praying for you. I listened to every word he spoke. For now, if you can, go home and turn on every light. Do not, and I repeat, do not let it get dark in there. You have to be brave, Becky. We'll be here if you need us. Should I go now? I asked. Mohit asked Jay's mom before getting back to me. No. Go in the morning. There's no telling what danger you'll be in right now. A night of terrible dreams awaited. There were bells, but louder, and with every ring my head hurt more. I was in the middle of a clearing in a dense forest. The night sky was devoid of the moon. The only light came from a large fire in the distance, around which a long-haired figure danced. His limbs were spindly and moved in an impossible manner. It was like a snake. He flowed as he danced around the fire, contorting and swinging his limbs. He seemed naked, and then I heard howls that sounded as if they came from the depths of human throats. They came from the trees all over. I was paralyzed, and a sense of doom took me. And then, I saw it in the sky. Tall and dark, the shadow rose. Two glinting yellow eyes and large horns reaching up higher than I could see. The rays of the sun woke me. The dreams had scared me so much that I would have wept again if I had more tears. Maximus was laying in between my feet, looking up at me with innocent eyes. I held him and let out a silent cry alone in the car. The daylight had given me some courage and when I got to my apartment, I wasn't surprised to find it empty. The door had been wide open. I felt a sense of relief when Maximus walked around the place without being spooked, but still checked every corner to make sure I was alone. I turned on every light I could and began to leave when I heard someone walking into the apartment. It was Jay. I froze for a second looking at him. His eyes looked tired, and he still wore the same clothes from the night before. He stumbled and then before he could say something, he collapsed on the floor. He reeked of alcohol and as much as I wanted I didn't want to leave him like that. I got him a pillow and a blanket since I couldn't drag him to the bed. I hesitated but put a hand over his head, and he grabbed it softly. With his eyes still closed, he began to speak in a soft, drunken voice. Becky, I love you. He said, I'm scared. He began to sob. I'm here, I said, comforting him. Please tell him to stop, he said. Who, I asked with a chill running down my spine, the old man at the door and he wants me to let him in, he said. Look. I looked towards the open door, scared. There was no one there. Becky. I... He said. I think I did something bad. What did you do? I asked him. It's okay, tell me. I bit my lip, anticipating whatever was to come, while still keeping an eye on the door. In India. On the way to my village, I met a man. Jay opened his eyes, looking up at the ceiling. He was alone on the road surrounded by a forest. He looked like a hitchhiker. I don't know why, but I stopped for him. Jay's eyes widened out of fear and I felt him tremble. I... He passed out, drunk. I called Jay's mom, even though it was probably the middle of the night back in India. She got Mohit on the phone and they told me that they would me that they had contacted a local priest and that they would be performing a cleansing prayer tomorrow. He assured me that I shouldn't worry, and that things will be fine, but for now, I should keep my distance no matter what. I was tempted to listen to Jay's heartbeat. Maybe this time I would hear something. But the idea of touching him just made me feel anxious. It was like hugging a spider. Even though I was afraid, the sunlight made me a little bold. I felt a little tug on my pants, and I saw Maximus down there tugging at my pants. 
He seemed a little more relaxed, so I picked him up and put him next to his bowl of food. I lay on the bed watching the sun and looked at my phone. I called in sick to work and scrolled on my phone for a while, looking for similar situations such as mine. I fell asleep without knowing when and woke up right in the middle of the night. I jolted up scared and knowing what I had just done and then walked out into the living room. Jay wasn't there and the door was open a crack. However, what was even more odd was his clothes laying right in the middle of the floor as if he just slipped out of them and never bothered to put them away. I checked out into the halls, but they seemed empty and there were no signs of him at home as well. I tried calling him, but his phone was still in his pants. I decided then that I should take my mother-in-law's advice and leave. I got my stuff and began looking for Maximus. I knew he would be in here somewhere as the door wasn't open wide enough for him to leave. I checked in the living room, under the couch and behind the television stand, but he wasn't there. Then I go to the bedroom and look under the bed and my heart stops in my chest. I see my husband, naked and under the bed on all fours. His face was frozen in a smile and stayed in place as his eyes locked onto me, following me around. He was unmoving, almost as if paralyzed, only his eyes moved. I couldn't see all of his body, it was concealed by darkness under there. The house had been completely lit and I really hoped that Maximus wasn't under there. I immediately ran into the bathroom still facing the bed and praying that he doesn't come out but he wasn't there either. I couldn't find him and even though I wanted to look more, I was scared. I ran out of the house and sat in my car. I am completely lost and I have no idea what's going on anymore. I called 911 and waited in my car for the cops to show up. Why is this happening to me? I feel like I'm stuck in a terrible nightmare and I wake up. I just want things to end. I feel like a coward right now and I really hope no one has to suffer because of my lack of any strength. I don't know if anything is listening to my prayer right now, but I just want my life back. My headache's back again and I'll end this post here, but I'll update again as soon as I can. If you're reading this, please cherish what you have. Be grateful for your loved ones and tell them how much you appreciate them. I'll see you soon. I've been living in a nightmare. As I waited for the police to arrive that night, I considered driving away. I just did not want to stay there anymore. My mind began to dissociate while I wept. I felt trapped. When the police finally arrived, I stepped out of my car. I told them my side of the story, telling them about how my husband had been acting completely out of character lately. They told me that the most they could do was talk to him about it and maybe give him a warning. I did not want that, but I couldn't think straight. My head pounded in agony and my chest felt hollow. I followed them upstairs. My sense of fear fading away as reality felt more like a fading dream. Surely I must be dreaming. I stood back as the police entered our apartment and I heard the mumble inside. I stared at the doorway, my mind going numb. I began to loose my footing, but somehow held myself up. I needed something to focus on or I would have surely passed out. I tried to listen in on the conversation. Stepping closer to the door to get a better listen, I realized that I hadn't heard Jay's voice. I entered the apartment and found Jay on our bed, sitting up and staring blankly at the officers, his eyes sleepy and tired. Noticing me, one of the two officers asked me to follow them outside. One of the men stayed at the doorway, cautiously watching for Jay. After asking me if my husband had a history of substance abuse, he made his assurances that I could call them if something like this happens again and that they could recommend resources for domestic violence support. I stood at the doorway, watching the officers leave as I contemplated what to do next. I decided to be brave and walked in. Jay sat on the bed looking tired. His eyes followed me, glistening with tears. I made sure that every light in the apartment was turned on before entering the bedroom. Jay turned his face away from me when I did. I'm sorry, I said, breaking the silence. I made sure to keep my distance from him. No, you did the right thing. He said, I, I love you so much, Becky. I'm scared. I don't know what's going on and I'm scared of hurting you. I felt tears run down my face too. 
I restrained myself. I did not want to get close to him, since I was afraid. But at the same time I felt guilty. I felt guilty for not knowing what to do, and for being so deathly afraid of the man I love. I managed to get some words out through my sobs trying to be brave. Jay, please tell me what's going on. What did you do? What happened back in India? I... Jay cut off, finally mustering some courage to look me in the eyes. Becky, you need to leave. I walked up to him, mustering up the courage to put my hand on his shoulder. Jay. He collapsed onto the bed, conscious but drained. I jumped, startled by my phone ringing. I answered it without checking, knowing who it was. Hi, Mohit here. Um, you guys should come here, he said in an awkward tone. I think... I heard my mother-in-law in the back talking, making Jay's cousin translate every line. This is serious. Auntie talked to a local priest and, there's forces at work beyond us. I know this is hard to believe, but trust me, Becky. I felt my stomach drop. I heard Mohit go on, translating for me everything that Jay's mom said. They even offered to pay for our trip, pleading that I come back. I still did not know what to believe. I did not want to believe. My husband was sick and he needed a doctor, not this. Mohit, I'm handing over the phone to Jay. No, I heard Jay whisper. Don't. I knew that pleading with him would be useless, so I did not bother. I instead put Jay's mom on the speaker, who then began talking to Jay in Hindi. Jay seemed completely indifferent to what his mom said, just responding with one-word answers, seemingly dismissive. Before hanging up, she wanted to talk to me one more time. Becky, I've found someone who can help, Mohit translated. They should be reaching out soon. I spent that night at a hotel, leaving Jay alone in the apartment. Even though I was away from him, my paranoia kept me up the whole night. That and the migraine. I turned on the television and played it in the background, fearing the silence, and I made sure to leave every light on, afraid of the shadows. I thought of Maximus and, even though I am not religious, I sent a prayer out for him. I prayed that he was safe and that I would see him again. I couldn't get the thoughts of the little baby out of my head, but I had no more tears to shed for the night. In a fucked up way, I was relieved that he was away from whatever was happening with Jay, but I only wish he was safe with me, curled up in my arms. Sleep took me and I was back in another nightmare. I heard Jay's screams in a dark forest. It was impossibly dense and hard to navigate, but somehow my body moved of its own accord. I knew this was a dream, and I tried to wake myself up, dreading each step my body took on its own. I came to stop at what looked like an ancient fort. Jay's screams sounded more agonized. I began walking to the fort, trying my hardest to wake up, dreading whatever was inside it. My husband's screams had turned increasingly inhuman. I woke up sweaty. I blinked a couple of times, trying to get my eyes adjusted to the dark. There were strange white lights next to my eyes that bothered me. I rubbed my eyes a couple of times, trying to make out the light. Then I realized something that made a deep primal fear set in. I had left the lights on before going to bed. I was in complete darkness, and the light in front of my eyes, the tiny white rings of light, were eyes. I was paralyzed, unable to move. I knew for a fact that I was fully awake and this wasn't a part of my dream. There was something in the bed with me and it had its arms around me, much like my husband would have. But this thing was not my husband. This thing was not Jay. Its head was way too elongated and it had horns on its head. It had a sickeningly hooked nose and a mouth curved into a perpetual frown. Its skin was leathery and I felt its claw-tipped hands caress my back. It had an expression on its face that looked like excitement. Slowly, it sat upright. It began to walk backwards. Tiny white eyes still locked onto me as it disappeared into the darkness. My throat felt numb. If I wanted to scream, I couldn't. I felt faint and everything seemed to be closing in on me. My phone had been buzzing on the bed and I reached for it, answering it hastily, my hands shaking. Hello? A female voice said from the other side. Hello? Is this Rebecca Kyle? I put the phone in my pocket, walking out of my room without answering. It was just a dream. I kept telling myself quietly, just a dream. 
Hello? The caller kept asking. Rebecca? I felt a scratch on my back, near my shoulders. My soul felt cold. Blood turned to ice as things began to set in. Desperately, I tried to convince myself that it was fake. Hello? I finally answered, walking down to the hotel lobby. My voice was shaky, but I didn't care to suppress the fear anymore. Hi, Rebecca. I'm sorry to be calling you so early. I'm Maya. Your mother-in-law gave me your number. I was wondering if I could talk to you about what's going on. I just landed in LA from Denver, and I could get a cab to your address if that's alright. I paused. Who are you? I asked. I'm a friend. You can trust me, I heard Maya say. I felt fear in my guts as she said that. Something about the way she said it gave me chills. I was desperate, and after what just happened I did not want to be alone anymore, so I offered to drive her. After I hung up, I realized that I had many missed calls in the past couple of hours from my mother-in-law. I called her back. She reassured me through Mohit that Maya could help. Maya was a very ordinary-looking woman. Ethnically ambiguous, she was a woman with reddish, curly hair and dark brown eyes. She stood shorter than me and wore a flowing, traditional Indian suit in black. A black string loosely hung around her neck. There wasn't an ounce of weariness on her face. Despite her friendly manner, something about the woman struck me as odd. She greeted me with a huge smile on her face and got into my car, carrying only a backpack. I was just relieved to have some company, especially after what happened. I got onto a flight as soon as I heard about your husband. I'm really sorry that you have to go through this, she said. Reaching into her bag, she grabbed a piece of dark string Wear this around your neck, she said. Protection. It is important that you put this on before we talk about anything. I let her put it on me, silently compliant. I felt hypnotically drawn to this woman as much as I was afraid of her. Now, she said with her friendly manner, let us begin. What? I asked. Oh, I guess I should give you a proper introduction first. I'm what you can call a priest, not exactly, but maybe something close. Your mother-in-law reached out to a colleague of mine and he reached out to me, since I was the closest to you. I've worked with situations like this before. I think I can help you, but you need to stay calm and try to stick with me through this thing, even though it will get difficult at times. I nodded. I began to tell her my side of things and slowly, Everything spilled out. I told her about the heartbeat, my cat going missing, the nightmares, and with great difficulty, the thing I saw at the hotel. Oh, she said, her lips twitching as she tried to, to smile out of excitement. I'm so terribly sorry. You said you had a cat? She asked. Yes. She smiled. I see. And you say it's been missing? I nodded. She frowned, feigning sympathy. I'm sorry, but cats are highly sensitive animals. Maybe we will see it again after all of this is over. Let's meet your husband. I would like to hear his side of things. I complied, driving towards the apartment. I gripped the wheel hard, feeling like a fish drawn into depths where a predator lurked. And do not worry, she said, patting my shoulder, smiling widely. I'm a friend. So yeah, that's it for today, guys. I hope the author of this story will share more parts in future. Then I will share with you. Peace out.